The sharp chill of a November wind cut through my coat as I walked across the vacant lot in downtown Chicago, the remnants of a demolished building crunching underfoot. Gray clouds hung heavy above, mirroring the desolation that had crept into my life. It was as if the universe itself had conspired to paint a perfect picture of my inner turmoil. Broken, barren, and cold. As I stood there, contemplating the starkness around me, memories flooded back. I had been at the top of my game once, a rising star in the corporate world, but a series of bad decisions had left me just like this desolate plot of land, empty and forgotten. It felt like an apt metaphor for my life at the moment, a life once vibrant and successful, now just a shadow of its former self. Shaking off the melancholy, I decided to take a shortcut through the lot to reach the warmth of the nearby cafe. That's when I saw her, Anna. She was distributing food to the homeless, her smile a stark contrast to the gloomy surroundings. Her red scarf fluttered in the wind, a splash of color in the monochrome world. I had seen her before at various community events, always at a distance, always radiant and engrossed in her work. Today, something about her struck a different chord in me. Maybe it was the way she interacted with people, her warmth cutting through the cold air, or maybe I was just tired of feeling alone. On impulse, I approached her, my heart thumping unusually hard. Hi, I've seen you around at the shelter, I said, trying to sound casual, but my voice betrayed a hint of nervousness. She looked up, her hazel eyes locking with mine, a slight surprise registering on her face. Oh, hi, she replied, her voice as warm as her smile. I'm Anna. Do I know you? No, not really. I mean, I volunteer at the shelter sometimes. I'm Eric, I stammered, offering my hand. Her hand was worn as she shook mine, her grip firm and confident. Nice to meet you, Eric. Are you here to help today? She asked, gesturing to the supplies. Actually, I was just passing by, but I'd love to help. I found myself saying, surprised at my own eagerness. As we worked side by side, distributing meals and warm clothes, the cold seemed to recede. Anna's presence brought a warmth that thawed the frostiness inside me. Her laughter was infectious, and her passion for helping others was evident. For the first time in months, I felt something stir within me, a spark of hope, a desire to be part of something larger than my own troubled thoughts. As the day drew to a close, I didn't want to part ways just yet. Would you like to grab a coffee? I asked, hoping she would say yes. She hesitated for a moment, then smiled. I like that, she said. We walked to the cafe, side by side, the setting sun casting long shadows on the pavement. It was the beginning of something new, something unexpected. I couldn't have known then how deeply Anna would change my life, for better and for worse. Three weeks later, Anna invited me to a charity gala she was organizing to raise funds for a new local youth center. The event was to be held at an upscale hotel downtown, promising an evening of elegance and philanthropy. Despite my aversion to such gatherings, where small talk was the main course and pretentiousness dessert, I found myself agreeing without hesitation. It was Anna's enthusiastic involvement that sold me. She believed in the cause passionately, and I wanted to support her in any way I could. I arrived at the event wearing my best suit, feeling slightly out of place among the glittering dresses and sharp tuxedos. The ballroom buzzed with the sound of a live jazz band, and the air was perfumed with a mix of floral arrangements and expensive cologne. I spotted Anna immediately, radiant in a deep blue gown, her hair styled elegantly, mingling with guests with a grace that made it seem effortless. She caught my eye and waved me over, her smile a beacon in the crowded room. Eric, you made it, she exclaimed as I approached. Thank you so much for coming. Let me introduce you to some people. Anna led me around, introducing me to various guests, local business owners, politicians, and other influencers in the community. Her charisma and genuine enthusiasm for the project were infectious, and I found myself drawn into conversations I would have normally avoided. The evening passed in a blur of bidding wars over silent auction items and pledges for donations, all orchestrated by Anna's tireless energy. As the crowd began to thin, Anna and I finally had a moment to ourselves. We settled into a quiet corner with a view of the city skyline illuminated against the night sky. I'm really impressed, Anna. 
You put together a fantastic event, I said, watching her as she watched the city. Her eyes reflected the twinkling lights. She turned to me, her expression softening. It's one thing to organize an event like this, but it's another to see people actually showing up and contributing. It makes all the hard work worth it, she replied, her gaze meeting mine. Just then, a slow, soft tune began to play, and couples started drifting towards the dance floor. Would you like to dance? I asked, offering my hand. Anne hesitated, a flicker of surprise crossing her features before she placed her hand in mine. I'd love to, she said. As we moved to the music, her head resting against my shoulder, I realized how easy it was to be with her. The rest of the world seemed to fade away, leaving just the two of us, moving in sync to the rhythm of the music. It was a perfect moment, one of those rare times when everything just felt right. Little did I know as I held her close that this evening would mark the beginning of a journey filled with more ups and downs than I could have ever imagined. Anna was an enigma, a woman of many layers, and as we danced, I was only just beginning to peel them back. In the weeks that followed the charity event, my connection with Anna deepened. We found ourselves eagerly carving out time to see each other amidst our hectic schedules. Each meeting, whether for coffee or a quick lunch during a break, seemed to stitch our lives closer together. Anna introduced me to her world of community service and activism, where I found a newfound purpose helping others. She had this incredible ability to make everyone around her feel important, heard, and cared for. It was intoxicating, and I admired her more with each passing day. One crisp Saturday afternoon, as autumn painted the city in hues of orange and red, Anna and I decided to take a walk through the park. Leaves crunched under our feet, and a gentle breeze played with strands of her hair. We talked about everything and nothing at all, from our favorite books and movies to our dreams for the future. As we paused by the lake, watching families and couples enjoying the day, Anna turned to me, her eyes sparkling with a seriousness I hadn't seen before. Eric, I've been meaning to ask you, she began, her voice tentative. What are you looking for in all of this? I mean, us. I reached for her hands, holding them gently between mine. The question had lingered in my mind, too, unasked but ever-present. I've been doing a lot of thinking, I admitted, searching her face for signs of her thoughts. And I realize I'm looking for something meaningful, lasting. I feel something strong with you, Anna. I'm not interested in just a fleeting connection. Anna's face lit up with a smile, a mixture of relief and happiness radiating from her. I'm so glad to hear that, she said, squeezing my hands. I feel the same way, Eric. There's something special here. I don't want to rush anything, but I also don't want to ignore what's happening between us. Heartened by her words, I pulled her closer, and we shared a kiss by the lakeside, tender and confirming of our mutual feelings. It was a kiss that seemed to seal a silent promise between us, a promise to explore this budding relationship with all the seriousness and joy it deserved. Over the next few months, our relationship grew. We met each other's friends, shared intimate dinners, and even started talking about future plans subtly woven into our conversations. Anna was always open and honest, and it pushed me to offer her the same vulnerability and openness. One evening, as we lay together on the couch in her apartment, listening to the rain tapping gently against the window, Anna nestled closer. Eric, she whispered, her voice soft and close, I think I'm falling in love with you. The words hung in the air, heavy with emotion. I felt my heart skip a beat as I wrapped my arm around her, pulling her even closer. I'm falling in love with you too, Anna. I confessed, the words feeling right and true. That night, we made love for the first time. It was a slow and passionate embrace, a physical manifestation of our growing love. It felt as if we were not just sharing our bodies but also our souls, connecting on a level deeper than either of us had expected. Love blossomed like the flowers of spring, full of hope and new beginnings. With Anna, I felt alive in ways I hadn't before. She challenged me, inspired me, and loved me in a way that made me believe that this was just the beginning of something extraordinary. Living with Anna felt like a dream I never wanted to wake up from. We moved in together into a cozy apartment that overlooked the park where we had shared many of our early dates. Each morning, I woke up to the smell of coffee and the sight of Anna, often humming softly while she prepared breakfast. Our home quickly became a haven, 
filled with laughter, music, and the warmth of shared love. Despite the bliss of our domestic life, however, not all was perfect. Anna's commitment to her community work meant she often came home late, exhausted, and sometimes too drained to share more than a few words. I tried to be understanding. After all, her passion for helping others was one of the things that drew me to her, but I couldn't help but feel a twinge of loneliness on the nights she wasn't there. Then there were the weekends taken up by her projects. Initially, I participated as much as I could, eager to be part of her world. But over time, the endless cycle of fundraisers, meetings, and emergency calls began to wear on me. I missed our quiet moments, our spontaneous outings, and I could feel a growing sense of resentment building inside me. One chilly evening as we sat at our dining table surrounded by stacks of grant applications and community outreach plans, I decided to broach the subject. Anna, do you think maybe this weekend we could just not do anything related to work? Maybe just go out, or even stay in and watch movies? I suggested tentatively, watching her reaction. Anna looked up from her papers, surprise evident in her eyes. I, I guess we could, she said slowly, her tone unsure. It's just that we've got that big fundraiser next week, and I really need to get these applications in. I know, I know, I interjected, feeling a surge of frustration. It's just that it feels like we're always so busy. I miss spending time with you, just us. Anna's expression softened, and she reached across the table to squeeze my hand. I miss that too, she admitted. I'm sorry, Eric. Let's make this weekend just about us, I promise. Relieved, I smiled and squeezed her hand back. That weekend turned out to be wonderful, reminding us of the importance of making time for each other. However, the underlying issue remained. Anna's work was her life, and while I admired her for it, I couldn't shake the feeling of being a secondary priority at times. Compounding our challenges was the issue of my family. My parents, traditional and somewhat conservative, struggled to understand Anna's free-spirited nature and her commitment to social activism. They'd often made offhand comments that I knew Anna found hurtful, despite her polite smiles. Your mother asked me again when we're planning to settle down and start a family. Anna told me one night, her voice tinged with irritation. It's like she thinks my work isn't a real job. I sighed, knowing this was just one of many similar conversations. I'm sorry, Anna. They just come from a different world, I guess. They love you, though, in their own way. Anna nodded, but the hurt lingered. I know. It's just hard sometimes. As we navigated these domestic blisses and discontents, it became clear that love was not just about sharing the joys, but also about bridging the gaps between our worlds. We were learning, sometimes struggling, but always striving to understand each other better. Each step, no matter how small, felt like progress, and I held on to the hope that our love would be enough to see us through. The balance of our domestic life took a sharp turn when Anna approached me one evening with a look of concern etched on her face. We had just finished dinner, and I could tell something was weighing on her mind throughout the meal. She hesitated before speaking, picking at the remains of her food. Eric, I need to talk to you about something important. She began, her voice serious. Of course, what's up? I responded, pushing my plate aside to give her my full attention. It's about Michael, she said, referring to her younger brother. Michael had always been a bit of the family black sheep, drifting from job to job, his latest venture being a small craft brewery that was struggling to get off the ground. He's in a bit of trouble, Anna continued, her eyes filled with worry. His business isn't doing well, and he's piled up some debt. He's behind on rent for the brewery, and if he doesn't pay soon, he'll lose the place. I knew how much Anna cared for her brother, despite the constant worry he caused her. What kind of trouble are we talking about? I asked, bracing myself. He needs money, quite a bit, to clear his debts and keep the brewery open, she replied. He's asked if I could lend him some money, around $30,000. The amount took me by surprise, and I felt a knot form in my stomach. $30,000 wasn't a small sum, and while we were doing well financially, a loan of that size would certainly affect our plans, plans for a potential vacation we had been discussing, and possibly delaying some of the home renovations we had outlined. I know it's a lot to ask, Eric, Anna said, her voice trembling slightly. But he's really desperate. 
I hate seeing him like this. I want to help him, but I also don't want to make this decision without your input. I took a deep breath, processing the information. Part of me wanted to help Michael for Anna's sake, but another part of me was incredibly hesitant. Lending money to family could be complicated, and $30,000 was no small favor. Have you thought about the implications of this? I asked cautiously. I mean, what if he can't pay us back? Are we prepared for that possibility? Anna nodded, biting her lip. I've thought about it, yes. I know it's risky. Michael says he has a plan to turn things around with a new marketing strategy and some fresh products. He's passionate about this brewery, Eric. He really believes it can work. Seeing her so determined made it hard to argue, but the practical side of me remained uneasy. I think we should consider this very carefully, I suggested. Maybe we can offer some help, but $30,000 all at once seems like a lot. Could we maybe start with a smaller amount? See how it goes. Anna looked relieved that I hadn't outright refused. That might work, she agreed. I'll talk to him about it. Maybe we can help in stages tied to specific milestones in his business plan. We decided to sleep on it and revisit the conversation with more concrete plans. Over the next few days, we drew up an agreement that outlined specific terms under which we would lend the money. It felt strangely formal, but I insisted that if we were going to do this, we needed to protect ourselves as much as possible. The conversation with Michael went better than expected. He was grateful for any help we could offer and agreed to the structured payment plan tied to his business milestones. Anna and I drew up a contract and Michael signed it, acknowledging the loan terms. Despite our precautions, I couldn't shake a lingering sense of worry. Money had a way of complicating relationships, and I hoped our effort to help wouldn't backfire on our relationship with Michael or between ourselves. As I watched Anna, so hopeful and determined to support her brother, I silently hoped that our decision would lead to success rather than regret. Months passed since Anna and I decided to financially assist her brother Michael with his brewery. Initially, there were positive updates, a successful product launch and a modest uptick in sales. Anna beamed with pride and relief with each small victory, her optimism bolstering my own hopes that everything might just work out. However, as autumn transitioned into a harsh winter, the warmth in our apartment seemed to cool, mirroring the growing chill outside. Michael's communications became less frequent and more evasive, and Anna's mood darkened with worry. One evening, while Anna was late at a community event, I decided to sort through some bills and paperwork. Amid the stack, I stumbled upon a recent bank statement that I hadn't seen before. Curious, I opened it, and my eyes were immediately drawn to several large withdrawals that I didn't recognize. They were substantial sums, and none had been discussed with me. Concern furrowed my brow as I sat back, the paper rustling ominously in my hands. When Anna returned home, I greeted her with a kiss but was unable to mask the serious undertone of my voice. Anna, I was going through our accounts and noticed some large withdrawals recently. Can you help me understand these? I asked, trying to keep my tone neutral but feeling the weight of suspicion in my stomach. Anna's face fell as she glanced at the statement I held out to her. Oh, she exhaled, a flicker of something unreadable crossing her features. That's for Michael. He needed a bit more help than we thought. I was going to tell you, I just, I didn't want to worry you until I had to. The explanation hung heavily between us. Disappointment and a twinge of betrayal mingled with my concern. Anna, we agreed we'd discuss these things, especially when it comes to more money. We need to make these decisions together, I said, feeling a divide opening slightly between us. Anna sighed, her shoulders slumping as she sat down heavily on the sofa. I know, I'm sorry. It's just, things have been slipping faster than he can handle, and he was so stressed. I panicked and wanted to help him immediately. I thought I could sort it out before it affected us. As reasonable as her motives might have been, the secrecy stone. It wasn't just the money, it was the trust that felt undermined. We talked deep into the night, airing our feelings and concerns. While I understood her urge to protect her brother, I emphasized the importance of transparency in our relationship. We reconciled, but a small seed of doubt had planted itself in my mind. Over the next few weeks, I couldn't shake off a lingering sense of unease. Anna seemed more withdrawn, often lost in thought, 
and her phone was never far from her side. One night, lying awake as she slept soundly next to me, curiosity overcame me. It was something I never thought I would do, but the gnawing doubt was too much. I reached over and quietly picked up her phone. I scrolled through messages and call logs, my heart racing. There was nothing explicitly incriminating, the frequent communications with Michael. Some late at night seemed more desperate and urgent than I had realized. As I put the phone back, guilt washed over me for snooping, yet I felt more confused and troubled than ever. The next day, I decided to confront the issue directly. I arranged to meet Michael at a local cafe to talk. As we sat down, his appearance was ragged, his eyes weary. Michael, I know things have been tough, but I need honesty now. Is there something you're not telling us? Is the business in worse shape than you've let on? I asked, hoping for some clarity. Michael hesitated, his gaze dropping to his coffee cup. It's bad, Eric. Worse than Anna knows. I didn't want to scare her more. I've been trying to fix it, but it's like patching up a sinking ship. The metaphor chilled me. Our financial aid, meant as a lifeline, seemed to have been consumed by a black hole. I thanked him for his honesty and left the cafe with a heavy heart, contemplating how to break this to Anna without fracturing what trust we had managed to rebuild. Suspicions, once awakened, cast long shadows, and as I walked home through the cold, biting wind, I realized how much our lives had become entangled with Michael's failing venture. The path ahead was uncertain, and for the first time, I wondered if our relationship could withstand the strain of a secret that was slowly coming to light. The winter grew colder, and the warmth between Anna and me seemed to follow suit. The revelation from Michael about the dire state of his brewery was a burden I carried home from the cafe, a weight that pressed down on me with every step. I dreaded the conversation that awaited, knowing it could potentially unravel the delicate threads of trust that still held Anna and me together. After a sleepless night wrestling with my thoughts, I decided it was time to confront the situation head-on. I waited for Anna to come home from one of her frequent late evenings at work. When I heard the keys jingle at the door, my stomach tightened. She entered, her face weary, shoulders slumped from exhaustion, or perhaps the weight of untold truths. Anna, we need to talk, I said as soon as she hung up her coat. My voice was firmer than I felt. She looked up, concern etching her features. What's wrong, Eric? It's about Michael. And the brewery. I began watching her closely. I met with him yesterday. He told me things are much worse than we thought. Why didn't you tell me? Anna's face paled, and she averted her gaze, confirming my worst fears that she had known more than she let on. I, I was going to. I just needed to figure out how to handle it without worrying you more, she stammered. The air between us felt charged, heavy with disappointment and betrayal. Anna, this isn't just about the money anymore. It's about us, our trust. I feel like you're not being honest with me, and that's what hurts the most, I said, the hurt evident in my tone. Anna sighed deeply and sat down, motioning for me to join her. Eric, I'm so sorry. I wanted to protect you and Michael. I thought I could fix it before it became a problem for us. I sat beside her, the distance between us feeling like miles. But it is a problem now. When you keep things from me, it makes me feel like you don't trust me or our relationship enough to handle the truth. She reached for my hand, her touch tentative. I do trust you, Eric. It's just... Sometimes, I feel like I need to handle things on my own, to prove I can manage. But you're right, I should have shared this with you. We talked into the night, unpacking not just the immediate financial debacle, but also airing deeper issues that had begun to creep into our relationship. Anna confessed that the pressure to keep her brother afloat was consuming her, leading her to make decisions she wasn't proud of. Determined to find a way through the mess, we devised a new plan. We would set clearer boundaries regarding financial aid for Michael, involving professional advice this time. Moreover, we committed to transparency in all our decisions, a pact to rebuild the trust we feared was slipping away. As we set about implementing our plan over the following weeks, the tension began to ease slightly. However, the shadow of the recent secrets lingered, a silent reminder of the fragility of trust. 
One afternoon, I returned home early to find Anna on the phone, speaking in hush, urgent tones. She didn't hear me come in. I know it's bad timing, but I can't pull any more money without raising suspicions with Eric. We need to find another way, she whispered into the phone. Hearing my name snap me to attention, I stood frozen, the implications of her words slicing through the fragile piece we had begun to rebuild. As she hung up, noticing my presence, the look on her face told me everything I needed to know. Eric, I can explain, she began, her voice shaking. I didn't need her to. The realization that there was more to the story than she had let on was clear as day. The foundation we had tried so hard to fortify was crumbling under the weight of new deceptions. That evening, as we faced each other across the ruins of our trust, the path forward was uncertain. The truth had been unraveling slowly, and now, confronted with the depth of the deceit, we both had to decide if what was left was worth salvaging. The revelations of that evening left a cold silence hanging between Anna and me. After her phone conversation had unwittingly exposed more deceit, we sat facing each other, each lost in a whirlpool of disappointment and betrayal. The room felt stifling, suffocating with unspoken words and the heavy weight of our fractured trust. Eric, please let me explain. Anna finally broke the silence, her voice a mixture of desperation and fear. She looked smaller somehow, diminished by the weight of her secrets. I rubbed my temples, feeling a headache brewing. Anna, how much more is there? How deep does this go? My voice was weary, drained of anger, and filled instead with a profound sadness. She took a deep breath, gathering the courage to lay bare the full extent of her actions. It's not just the loans to Michael, she admitted, her eyes not meeting mine. I've been covering his losses more extensively than you knew. I didn't want you to see me as a failure, unable to manage my family's problems. The confession hit me harder than I expected. It wasn't just the financial betrayal, but the emotional isolation it had fostered between us. Anna, why couldn't you trust me to support you? Isn't that what partners are supposed to do? I thought I was protecting you. From the stress, from the disappointment, she replied, her voice faltering. I was so wrong, Eric. I see that now. We talked for hours, dissecting every decision, every lie. It was the most honest conversation we had had in months perhaps the entire duration of our relationship. By the end, we were both emotionally exhausted, raw from the revelations and the vulnerability of our discourse. In the days that followed, a tense peace settled over us. We were together, but separately, each wrestling with our feelings and doubts about the future. I loved Anna deeply, but trust, once broken, was not easily mended. We sought couples therapy, a space to navigate our feelings with a professional's guidance. The sessions were tough, often emotionally charged, but they brought us gradually closer to understanding each other's fears and failings. Anna's fear of appearing weak or incompetent had driven her to conceal the truth. All my need for transparency stemmed from past relationships marred by deceit. As spring approached, bringing with it the promise of new beginnings, we slowly started to rebuild. The process was painstaking, like piecing together a shattered vase, knowing it would never be quite the same. Yet there was beauty in its imperfections, in the gold-filled cracks of our repaired trust, akin to the Japanese art of kintsugi, where the breakage and repair are treated as part of the object's history, not something to disguise. Anna took steps to resolve the financial mess with Michael, involving more transparent and professional approaches to managing his business debts. She also started to open up more about her day-to-day -day decisions, both personal and financial. For my part, I learned to articulate my insecurities and expectations without casting blame or asserting control. I had to accept that Anna's independent nature wasn't a threat to our relationship, but a cornerstone of her identity. By mid-spring, the frost between us had thawed. One evening, as we walked through the park where we had first confessed our love for each other, Anna stopped and turned to face me, her eyes reflecting the soft golden light of dusk. Eric, I know we've been through a storm. I can't change the past, but I am so grateful for your strength and patience. No matter what happens, I want you to know that I love you. I am committed to us, to this journey, however challenging it may be. I took her hand, feeling the familiar warmth that had drawn me to her in the beginning. 
I know, Anna, and I love you too. We're more than our mistakes, more than our past. Let's keep walking together. The road ahead was uncertain, the outcome of our efforts unclear. But we were moving forward together, step by step, with open hearts and a newfound respect for the truths that bind rather than divide. The spring brought not only a thaw in our relationship, but also unexpected challenges that would test our commitment to transparency and trust. As Anna and I navigated our slowly mending relationship, the situation with her brother Michael reached a critical point, bringing with it legal complications that neither of us had anticipated. One morning, I was sipping coffee and scanning the news when Anna walked into the kitchen, her face unusually pale. She held an envelope in her hand, her fingers trembling slightly. It's from Michael's lawyer, she announced, her voice barely above a whisper. My heart sank. What does it say? She opened the envelope with shaky hands and quickly read through the contents. He's being sued by one of his suppliers for unpaid bills, and they're dragging me into it since I was a guarantor for his latest business loan. The news hit like a physical blow. This was the nightmare scenario we had hoped to avoid. Okay, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. We need to handle this systematically. What's our first step? We need legal advice, Anna replied. She was already reaching for her phone. I'll call a lawyer. The one we met during the couple's therapy recommended someone good for business-related issues. Within days, we were sitting in a stark law office, the walls lined with legal books that seemed to loom over us, filled with judgments and decrees. The lawyer, Ms. Hammond, was a stern-looking woman with sharp eyes that seemed to miss nothing. After reviewing our case, Ms. Hammond laid out our options, none of them particularly promising. Given that you, Ms. Larkin, guarantee the loan, you could be held liable for the debts, she explained to Anna. We can argue that you were missled about the business's financial health, but it will be a difficult battle. Anna nodded, her face set with determination. I understand. We'll do whatever it takes to resolve this. The following weeks were grueling. We attended meetings with Ms. Hammond, gathered documents, and prepared for a possible court case. The stress was palpable, but Anna and I supported each other through every step, our recent commitment to openness providing a sturdy foundation during the shaky period. As the court date approached, the tension reached its peak. Anna was called to testify, and watching her take the stand was one of the hardest moments I had endured. She was calm and clear, but the strain was evident in her eyes. The cross-examination was brutal. Michael's supplier's lawyer was relentless, questioning Anna's credibility and her knowledge of Michael's business dealings. But Anna held her own, her honesty and integrity shining through her testimony. After what seemed like an eternity, the judge finally delivered the verdict. Anna would be responsible for a portion of the debts, but significantly less than the supplier had demanded. It was a partial relief, but the financial strain was still considerable. We'll manage, Anna said as we left the courthouse, her hand tight in mine. We've been through worse. We can handle this together. True to her word, we tackled the financial fallout as a team. It wasn't easy. We had to tighten our belts, reconsider some of our plans, and focus on rebuilding our financial security. But through it all, we never lost sight of the lessons we had learned about trust and communication. Legal reckonings had challenged us, but they had also shown us the strength of our bond. As we walked back into the light of a normal day away from the dark corridors of the courthouse, I felt a renewed sense of hope. No matter what challenges lay ahead, Anna and I knew we could face them together, strengthened by our love and fortified by the trials we had overcome. As the legal dust settled and the early signs of summer began to show, Anna and I found ourselves at a crossroads, not just in terms of our finances, but also in our personal journey together. The legal ordeal had drained us, yet paradoxically, it had also injected a new vigor into our relationship. We had weathered a significant storm. Now it was time to focus on rebuilding and moving forward. One evening, as we sat on our balcony watching the sunset, the city bathed in a warm golden glow, Anna brought up the topic we had been circling for weeks. Eric, what you think about starting fresh somewhere new? Maybe a change of scenery could give us the new beginning we both need. The idea resonated with me more than I had anticipated. The thought of leaving behind the city with its myriad of memories, both good and bad, was appealing. 
I think that could be exactly what we need. I agreed, feeling a surge of excitement at the prospect. Somewhere quieter, perhaps by the coast. Anna smiled, her eyes lighting up with enthusiasm. I was thinking the same. The coast could offer us a peaceful environment, and maybe even new opportunities for both of us. We spent the next few weeks researching and planning. We decided on a small coastal town known for its vibrant community and thriving local economy, which seemed like the perfect place to not just grow roots but to flourish. Selling our apartment and most of our belongings felt cathartic, like shedding an old skin. With each item sold and each goodbye said, I felt lighter, more ready to embrace whatever lay ahead. Anna felt it too. Her laughter came easier, her smiles brighter. When moving day finally arrived, it was bittersweet. We stood in our empty apartment one last time, holding each other close. Are you ready? Anna asked, a hint of nervousness in her voice. As ready as I'll ever be, I replied, squeezing her hand. The drive to our new home was long, but it passed quickly with our shared anticipation filling the car. We talked about everything we wanted to do once we arrived, walking on the beach, exploring local markets, maybe even starting some community projects together. Arriving at our new house was a surreal experience. The reality of our decision hit me as we stepped inside, the fresh paint smell, the bare rooms waiting to be filled, the sound of the ocean in the distance. It was a new beginning in every sense of the word. Over the next few months, we settled into our new life. Anna found joy in setting up the home, decorating each room with care and love, while I took to the local community, finding a surprising passion in community work, inspired by Anna's lifelong commitment to service. We also started a small business together, a cafe that quickly became a gathering spot for locals and tourists alike. Working together, facing the day-to-day -day challenges and celebrating small victories, brought us closer. Our relationship, forged and tempered by past trials, felt stronger and more resilient. As autumn returned, painting the leaves in fiery hues, I reflected on the journey Anna and I had embarked on together. From the depths of mistrust and betrayal to a renewed bond strengthened by adversity, we had come a long way. One crisp morning as we walked along the beach, the ocean waves rolling in rhythmically, I stopped and turned to Anna. The early light caught her face, highlighting her features that I had come to love so deeply. Anna, do you remember what you said about us being more than our mistakes? I asked, reaching for her hand. She nodded, her eyes meeting mine. I just want to say, I've never been more certain of anything in my life. Thank you for believing in us, for steering us towards this new beginning, I said, my voice thick with emotion. Anna smiled, her eyes glistening with unshed tears. I wouldn't have it any other way, she replied. Here's to new beginnings to us. To us? I echoed, and we sealed our pledge with a kiss, the ocean witnesses to our enduring love, ready to face whatever the future held, together.